Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, advance this to the first slide, which is uh, a basic um, description of who's doing all this. And I'm going to speak very briefly about the Fenian Historical Society uh, and then turn it over to Peter uh, for his own description of the Burlington Irish Heritage Festival. So uh, I got involved in all this uh, some couple of decades back when I wrote a book. Uh, I didn't know who the Fenians were and uh, ended up being um, uh, appointing myself president of the Fenian Historical Society. I'd be happy to, to have uh, folks that are interested in that, uh, that phase of Irish history to, uh, to sign up um, and, uh, and join me to, to pursue various commemorations and, and uh, items like that. Um, so why don't, Peter, why don't you say a few words about the... Um, um, Burlington Irish Heritage Festival, which I'm a long-term member of as well, yeah. but I'll let Peter speak to that. Okay, Th uh, thanks, Liam. So as Liam said, my name is Peter Keating. I'm a member of the Burlington Irish Heritage Festival Planning Committee. A little bit about that, I've uh, been around for 29 consecutive years now. We hold a variety of events, normally around St. Patrick's Day, every March, a little bit before, sometimes a little bit after, celebrating Irish culture. Uh, a lot of focus on music, dance, literature, language, etc. Um, you know, it, it's something that uh, is, well, we're into the middle of it right now, and we have a few more events that I want to highlight, especially as we end the whole festival this coming Sunday. Um, but after this particular presentation, tomorrow night is uh, a tribute concert for Mick Maloney, who is a very, very well-known Irish-American musician who happened to, to pass away last year. So we expect a pretty sizable crowd at St. Michael's College, McCarthy Arts Center in attendance of that. And at the end of that particular concert, for people who are there and want to hear more Irish music, there will be an Irish session at Four Quarters Brewery in Winooski. That is um, helped to sponsor the Mark Sustix group um, to, put, to put that together. Um, on Saturday, we have a couple of events, both taking place at the Fletcher Free Library in Burlington. One of children's crafts um, event and the other one called a slow session for those who may want to participate in an Irish music session, learn a couple of tunes, bring your instrument and figure out how to get into that sort of thing. And then the last event of the festival is on Sunday, our annual Kaylee, which is another celebration of music and dance. And this will be at Burlington City Hall. Um, you know, we are a small group that puts together this festival every year, and we're always looking for volunteers. So if anyone out there is interested in joining us, I'd like to hear from you. The poster on the left of your screen shows our website, BurlingtonIrishHeritage.org. You get on there, you'll find not only more about the events that we put on, but um, an email link to uh, let us know if you're interested in helping us. Also, we're willing to accept donations, if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it back to Liam to begin the presentation. Liam. All right. Thank you, Peter. It's a, uh, a good recap of uh, what the Burlington Irish Heritage Festival is about, but it's probably uh, uh, not applicable to some of the people that are coming to uh, join this program from Hawaii, so you won't have a <laughs> chance to uh, to uh, to visit uh, Burlington uh, this time, but uh, maybe next time. Um, so that's one reason we decided to do this by Zoom, is so it's not dependent on people uh, being just in the area. So with that, I'm going to um, give you a, a romp uh, through some of the high points of Irish history. Uh, covers. Uh, Three, three or four thousand years in uh, 10 minutes or so. <laughs> and <laughs> we'll try to weave a certain theme here in terms of uh, the nation once again, that uh, that's the independence that uh, is the, the, uh, the constant matter here. So 
Uh, many of you have probably been to, uh, to Ireland, uh, but I find it's always useful to start with some geography. Uh, I think you can all see my cursor. The British Isles uh, consists of uh, England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. So at various times, these each of these were it was its own kingdom, but uh, they all ended up under the English crown uh, back in the in the day. And that's uh, that's kind of the theme of, of working their way out from under that. Now, Ireland itself consists of four province provinces, uh, and for many years uh, it's been broken up into into counties as uh, subdivisions of, of the um, of the provinces. So the the um, the four provinces are. are Leinster, in the south there, or in the middle, uh, Munster in the south, Connacht in the west, and, and Ulster in the north. So you might notice the tier on the end of those three. Um, that's the word for, for country. Uh, so there's a, a, a pattern there. Now, there are six counties in Ireland and Northern Ireland and Ulster that were not, they were partitioned off from the Irish Free State when the treaty was, was uh, made. And uh, Peter will be going into this in much more detail, but that just gives you a, a, an overview in terms of geography. The, um, the Ireland, island of Ireland was been, has been occupied by humans for probably 10,000 years or so. Um, but we didn't get much records for them, just the archeological um, relics that are quite impressive. Uh, around 5,000 years ago, there were a series of tombs built uh, in a location called Bruna Boyne. Uh, and even though these people didn't have towns and, and cities, uh, they were able to cooperate, uh, probably for religious purposes. Uh, we, we're pretty sure that they uh, worshipped nature and would have seasonal celebrations at, at certain areas. But they, uh, the history of the original uh, inhabitants, the Fear Bog and the Tua de Dana, uh, is only survives in, in the legends that have been handed down because uh, uh, they were preliterate, as were the Celts. Celts started off somewhere in Central and Eastern Europe, um, but got pushed by pressures of other people farther and farther to the West. And about 5,000 years before the current era, um, Celts uh, began to appear in Ireland. Uh, some legends that have been handed down say that they sailed there from Spain. Um, Spain, of course, is the Iberian Peninsula, so there's a linguistic connection with Hibernia and Iberia. Um, but again, it was a pre-literate uh, group. Um, they didn't, didn't have uh, uh, a history to hand down other than oral history. Now, the, um, the nation of the, the Celts in Ireland was um, had a, a, a whole lot of different uh, kings at different times, and sometimes they were very loosely ro ruled over by the high king. Um, it was a warrior culture, and they fought extensively over the usual disputes, land, cattle, and women. Um, but it was a highly developed culture with art and, and uh, crafts, uh, stories, songs, poetry, and even a developed system of law. All of this was maintained through oral tradition. Uh, now, one of the uh, aspects of the, the uh, Celtic culture at this time was 
a group of selected warriors called the Fena, and they were at the beck and call of the High King to defend against foreign invaders. Uh, adjective for these warriors was called Fenian, and this will appear later as we go through the whole process of restoring a nationhood to, to Ireland. The cycle of Fenian tales features mostly around a particular leader called Finn McCool. This dates from around the third century of the current era, uh, but he shows up again as we uh, explore these uh, developments. Now, at the time, the uh, Celtic society was pagan. I uh, had a whole uh, pantheon of gods and goddesses with priests called druids, and they would celebrate uh, the seasons of the, of the year uh, at established sites. And Christianity was introduced by missionaries probably prior to St. Patrick, but he's kind of created uh, coming in around the fifth century of current era um, to make uh, Christianity the, the dominant religion. And we're, we're celebrating uh, his Saints Day on March 17th, which is supposedly the, the day that he died. Now, early Irish Christianity was monastic. It was not organized under bishops by diocese. diocese. And it also differed in significantly from some other policies of the Pope. Um, the calendar was celebrated on different days, and the clergy were allowed to marry. And so this became a factor. The, um, the Vikings came down from Scandinavia and raided Ireland in as early as the ninth century. They eventually established the first towns in Ireland uh, along the coast. And other Norman descents, Norsemen, um, had come from the province of Normandy in France and conquered England. And then they came to Ireland. Um, a lot of them uh, were named Fitz something because the F-I-T-Z is a, is a corruption of the Norman uh, feasts, meaning son of. Uh, these were uh, uh, usually bastard sons that were not going to inherit anything, so they were they were given a sword and say, you want land, you go take it. So there was only one English pope in Rome, and it was Adrian IV. Um, and he decided this was an opportunity to uh, allow um, a group of people to go to Ireland and enforce uh, conformity with, with the papal decrees. So in, in 1170, Strongbow went over there with a small but very disciplined group and began to uh, conquer Ireland. And the king was not far behind. Uh, when the next year he uh, took the crown of Ireland, uh, considered it a dual monarchy. It was, both the King of England and the King of Ireland. And they did uh, institute uh, much more conformity with the papal um, edicts uh, until Henry VIII, with these uh, multiple wives, uh, disputed with, uh, with Roman authority and he created his own church. He created a Church of England and a Church of Ireland uh, that was separate from the authority of the Pope. Now, most of the Irish remained faithful to the Roman Catholic Church, even though the English monarchs um, made it very inconvenient. They imposed a lot of restrictions and um, their Catholics were restricted in the property they could own, the professions they could pursue, uh, and their education. The Irish language, history, and culture were all suppressed. And almost all the power uh, then belonged to a very small group of non-Catholic landlords. Many of them lived in England. They didn't even live in Ireland, but they took their money from 
from uh, Ireland. And understandably, the Irish repeatedly rebelled against these oppressive rulers. Uh, it was often uh, a matter of uh, religious identification. And in the Battle of Kinsale in 1601, uh, the Catholic forces were were defeated and the nobles fled the country. It's called the, the Flight of the Earls. They were, went into exile, many of them in uh, France. Then in 1654, Cromwell, whose name is still not uh, terribly popular in Ireland, um, decided that uh, all the Irish could go to hell or to Connacht. He was wanted to push all the Irish west of the Shannon River in Connacht. And William of Orange, who was a Dutchman, a Protestant, um, won final victory over the uh, over the Catholics in 1690, the Battle of the Boyne, and that it's still celebrated um, by the Orange Order that takes its name from from uh, the prince who became king. Um, even though it's uh, it's been a while since uh, the Battle of the Boyne. Now, most of the Catholics at this point were reduced to subsistence farming. They were heavily dependent on the newly discovered potato that was brought from the, from the New World. Um, but whole swaths of Ireland were totally depopulated by both war and famine and being pushed west of the Shannon. Particularly up in Ulster, the, um, the English uh, and the Protestant Scots were brought in to settle these areas. And this is a, a nice little uh, demonstration of, uh, of how the plantation system was taking over. Um, and this predates the, uh, what we think of as plantations being down south in, the, in America. But this is how it got started. Now, both the French and the Americans had revolutions that uh, uh, made their countries into republics. And this inspired the revolt of the United Irishmen. The last time when um, Protestants and Catholics really cooperated to rebel against English rule. In response, the uh, Acts of Union in 1800 abolished the Irish Parliament that it had existed up to that point. Robert Emmett was a famous um, patriot that uh, tried to rebel against the English in 1803 and was thoroughly executed. He was hanged, beheaded, drawn, and quartered. But before that, he had uh, an inspiring speech from the dock as a defendant saying that uh, they shouldn't, people shouldn't raise monuments to, to him until Ireland was free. So uh, the Emmett Monument uh, Society was, uh, was kind of a code word for um, working toward independence. And a series of potato failures um, kind of culminating in Black 47 uh, reduced uh, the 8 million people in Ireland uh, by about a quarter. About a million of them died of disease and hunger, and another million fled the country. So a group called the Young Irelanders in, um, in 1848 rose up uh, in response to this, uh, this famine. Now, one of these leaders was Thomas Francis Marr. While he was visiting in Paris, he was given a new flag uh, for, for Ireland that was patterned after the, the French tricolor of red, white, and blue. Um, the flag was uh, displayed at a, at a huge rally that year later on top of Slieve de Mont, the mountain in Tipperary that's said to be the tomb of Finn McCool. So you can see that Finn McCool is still kind of the inspiration for, for um, 
warriors driving out the invaders. The three colors of the flag are green for the Catholics, orange for the Protestants, harking back to William of Orange, and a white field between the two faiths, uh, hopefully designating peace. <coughs> Excuse me. Two of the people who fought in the um, 1848 uprising, uh, John O'Mahony and James Stevens, developed a new nationalist strategy uh, that had no compunction about uh, using force to, to free uh, Ireland. Uh, O'Mahony went to the US and he um, revived the whole concept of the Fenians and McCool and all. Um, with the Fenian Brotherhood. Stevens organized the secret, the underground Irish Republican Brotherhood in Ireland. That was treason. That was uh, that was cause for execution. Uh, but the branches that were armed in both, or the members in both these branches uh, were called the Irish Republican Army. And Fenian became the common adjective to identify these militant Irish nationalists. And Finn McCool's sunburst flag, the Galgrania, became its symbol. The Fenians uh, organized in the British state militias, uh, recruiting Irishmen and getting training and probably hoping to steal the muskets when they uh, went to Ireland. Uh, while in the um, in Ireland, the uh, underground circles of sworn I IRB, Irish Republican Brotherhood people were being organized. There were plans to, um, to go to Ireland with armed Fenians from the USA, uh, but it was these Plans were unfortunately disrupted when America descended into civil war in 1861. Fenians and Irishmen of all types uh, fought in both the Union and Confederate forces in the American Civil War. Uh, many of them fought in Fenian units like the Irish Brigade and Corcoran's Legion that were identified with, uh, with the Fenian movement. Uh, after the American Civil War, uh, the Fenian units attacked the British Canada from both New York and Vermont in 1866 and 1870. And each time they would cross the border and make the declaration that uh, an independent Ireland was now established by force of arms. It's a very fanciful painting of the Battle of Ridgeway in southern Ontario, just across from Niagara Falls, 1866. They did uh, attempt risings in Ireland in the 1860s um, after the American Civil War. Uh, when the invasions of Canada failed, the Fenian Brotherhood was largely replaced in the U.S. by Clan na Gael uh, as being the, the main militant Irish nationalist movement. Uh, but the Irish Republican Brotherhood continued and expanded in the early 1900s. And a school teacher named Patrick Pierce spoke uh, at the Dublin funeral in Glasnevin for one of the old Fenians who had been exiled to the US and was brought back to be buried in, in Ireland in 1915 a very moving uh, talk. And he said that the, the fools, meaning the British, have left us our Fenian graves. And that as long as uh, Ireland had these Fenian graves, uh, Ireland and free would never be at peace. Now the British had promised to grant Ireland uh, an improved status of home rule in 1914. But then the World War I broke out in August of that year. This postponed any implementation. But Patrick Pierce and the IRB 
took um, took uh, the reins and uh, led an uprising in Dublin and other parts of the country, but it was centered mostly in Dublin. The headquarters were at the General Post Office, the GPO, and on the steps of the GPO, uh, he read out this um, declaration um, on the provisional government of the Irish Republic and the people of Ireland. Uh, and he credits in this um, the I Irish Republican Brotherhood. Uh, they lasted three days, but they brought in our the British brought in artillery, and that's what uh, that's the ruins of of the um, general post office after they'd uh, um, bombarded it. Uh, they surrendered, and the leaders uh, were tried and executed, shot at Kilmainham Jail. Uh, Pierce and a dozen or so others. Uh, one guy that was not executed was Eamon de Valera. He was spared largely because he'd been born in New York, still had U.S. citizenship, and the British uh, were avoiding alienating their ally, the U.S., because they needed uh, the support for World War I that was still going on. The war ended, the World War, the war to end all wars uh, ended in 1918. Uh, and the independence movement was having great success with the organization of Sinn Féin, meaning we ourselves, and the guerrilla warfare that had been launched by the IRA fighters. This was, uh, led to the Anglo-Irish War, 1919 to 21. Uh, particular unit called the Black and Tans was staffed with former British army officers and they were notorious for um, for atrocities in the in the uh, the very nasty guerrilla warfare. Um, this picture is of the third temporary brigade. These were IRA people. There's not a, a common hat in the in the group, I don't think the uniforms are were um, were not important, but they all had, were armed with the same uh, weapons um, and uh, did a very credible job of of uh, causing the British uh, great problems. There were also militia units formed in the north by the Ulster Volunteers, quite sizable units, uh, heavily armed by the British. Um, their goal was to remain with the British Union. Um, after uh, World War I and the Anglo-Irish War, the British government was, um, uh, society was war-weary and the, and the government uh, under Ramsay MacDonald accepted uh, a treaty that they gave limited, very limited independence for Ireland. Uh, with partition of the island and where six counties in Ulster would remain with the under British rule. Um, and that process will go on, be explored in some detail. I'll turn this over to to Peter and um, hopefully if you've got any questions you can you can stick them in the uh, chat and we'll have a chance to talk after we've gone through the the slideshow here. So I think we're at the uh, point where Peter takes over. <clears throat> gotcha. Uh, thanks, Liam. Uh, so Liam has set the very, very long historical story of the many years and, and, and actually centuries of struggle of the Irish against the various outsiders. I'm now going to take a very, very narrow, relatively narrow historic view and talk about events that occurred in the late 19 teens to the mid 1920s. And I'm probably going to repeat or reiterate a whole bunch of points that Liam's already made, but some of these are very important to getting to Irish independence and eventual US recognition, which is what we're commemorating today. So um yeah, it is very important too to know that the the probably most the biggest catalyst for change in Ireland during this period was the Easter Rising in 1916. 
1918, in the elections for the British Parliament, Sinn Féin, the party that um, supported total independence uh, of Ireland, won overwhelming support throughout most of Ireland. Um, what they did was they set up their own parliament in 1919 called Doyle Aaron in Dublin. Um, and they put a pretty strong emphasis early on in trying to get international recognition of, of their, their legitimacy. Um, unfortunately, the British did not agree with what the Irish were doing and the Anglo-Irish War ensued over 1919 and 1921. A little comment on this map. This is the general election uh, map of 1918. The dark green is where Sinn Féin won, and it's pretty much overwhelming the, the map of Ireland, especially in the southwest and the northwest. But you'll see different colors in the northeast. And those are areas that supported maintaining ties uh, to Great Britain. And this is a message going back to plantation that Liam had talked about in the 17th century, where, where loyalist Scots and, and uh, English were brought over, planted in, in Ulster, driving the Irish off the land. And the vestige of that is the people who stayed there maintain their allegiance to Great Britain and their Protestant faith. So, and eventually this map is why we ended up with partition in, uh, after the Anglo-Irish Treaty was, uh, was uh, negotiated and agreed to. <clears throat> uh, next slide, Liam, can you move that? So on the other side of the ocean, there were three different U.S. presidential administrations that overlapped these events that were going on in Ireland. The first was Woodrow Wilson. He was our president during World War I. At the end of that World War, Wilson put a pretty strong focus on establishing the League of Nations. And the point there was to set up an international organization that would mediate disputes and hopefully avert any future world war. Because uh, Wilson really needed to have Great Britain, another major world power, uh, as part of those negotiations and, and setting up the League of Nations, he did not focus on Ireland. It was considered a peripheral issue. Um, by the way, the photograph here on your right is Wilson on the left, uh, Warren Harding on the right, uh, on their way from the White House to the Washington, um, to the Capitol for Harding's um, inauguration in 1920. Now, Harding also had some sympathies to the Irish cause, like Wilson did, but it just didn't become a priority within his administration. And he only served a little over two years before he died in office. Um, and when he died, the vice president, Calvin Coolidge, there's a small tangential Vermont connection there, uh, became president. Um, there were some congressional efforts in the late teens and early 20s amongst the House and Senate members to get U.S. recognition of Ireland. A lot of Irish American supporters were in Congress at the time, but there were eight separate resolutions introduced just in 1991 or 1921 alone to um, recognize uh, Ireland, but none of them ever made it out of committee, never made it to a floor vote in either the House or the Senate. Change the slide, Liam. So there was eventually a treaty to end the Anglo-Irish War. It was in 1921. Uh, the war ended, and it resulted in the partition of Northern Ireland, as we've referred to a couple of times now. The six counties of Northeast Ulster were separated into a separate political entity to remain part of Great Britain. It established the Irish Free State in the rest of the island of Ireland. And what it did was it designated or, or it called the Irish Free State another dominion within the British Commonwealth. What that meant was Ireland did not have full independence. It had status like Canada or Australia or New Zealand or South Africa, where essentially it had no control over its foreign policy. But these are the terms that Ireland agreed to with, with the British government at the time. And on the right, you see the New York Times headline at the time that came to agreement in 1921 to end the war. Um, interestingly, the, the chief negotiator for Ireland during these negotiations in London in 1921 was someone named Michael Collins. Uh, he was a very, very popular leader of um, Sinn Féin in Ireland. When he made this, the agreement to the terms in, in London in 21, he did write a letter to his fiancée and said he feared he was 
he was signing his name to his own death warrant as a result of the conditions he agreed to. That did prove to be prophetic. Um, just within a year, he was killed during the Irish Civil War. Next. So the Civil War started after the, the treaty was agreed to. The parliaments in Great Britain, as well as Ireland, agreed to the terms of it. There was a significant faction within Ireland that was considered anti-treaty, did not like the terms, and they ended up going to war with the, the pro-treaty forces. And they had a short civil war between 1922 and 23. Um, the issues, not surprisingly, were uh, partition. You know, why would you segregate part of the island to separate away and maintain that loyalty to Great Britain and not allow it to be part of the, the, the new independent, fully, the whole island of Ireland, an independent country? Also, the Dominion status part was uh, rankled some of the anti-treaty faction in Ireland because it wasn't full independence. And they cited the fact that they had to still defer to Great Britain for foreign policy. And they still had an oath to the king, a loyalty oath to the king, which was considered pretty repugnant by a lot of Irish people. Um, the Damnable Question was the title of a, a history back in the 1970s, I think it was, by uh, historian George Dangerfield. And this, um, it was a very um, detailed study of Irish and English relations in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And the Daniel question referred to the fact that during negotiations, um, the British did not agree to trying to see if a 32 county all Ireland republic would work. Um, the author of the book, of the book um, suggests that it likely wouldn't, considering the significant pushback um, uh, against that from the, the population in, in the north of Ireland, as well as from the British Parliament. But the fact that it wasn't given an opportunity to see if it might succeed or fail was that damnable question. Well, you know, what if this could have, you know, been a solution at the time? What would have happened if it happened? If, um, if they were allowed to come, you know, to agree to that 32 county republic. Anyway, it's a thesis of the book and it's a very good history of um, Irish and uh, uh, English relations during this time. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, there was a strong attempt, uh, priority put on the new Irish government, even before uh, the Irish Free State was established, to try and come up with or get other countries or other organizations to recognize Ireland as, a, a, as an independent country on their own. Their first success actually was with, was with the League of Nations, which was a new organization, as I mentioned earlier, that President Wilson really pushed to found, um, based in Switzerland, where all nations would come together and discuss world issues and hopefully avert um, future conflicts. Um, anyway, they welcomed the Irish delegation in 1923 and agreed that they could be accepted into that. So this was the very, very first attempt where um, uh, Ireland gained some sort of international recognition um, by some group um, or some other country. Important to note that the League of Nations um, it was never approved by the United States. It was part of the Treaty of Versailles ending World War I, and the, the U.S. Senate never um, approved that treaty. So although our president at the time really supported it, we, the U.S. never signed on to it. And the League of Nations had probably a checkered history one of its uh, um, purposes was to avoid future conflicts and wars, and it failed pretty miserably at that because we had World War II just another decade or two later. And the organization itself just fizzled after World War II. It was disbanded in 1946. But now its successor is the United Nations, which we're all pretty familiar with. Next slide. So in, in Ireland's attempt to get the U.S. to recognize um, the free state as a legitimate independent country, they sent this guy here, Timothy Smitty, to Washington, D.C. Uh, a little bit about him. He was an academic. Actually, he was a, an economics professor at University College Cork. He was a personal friend of Michael Collins and actually accompanied Collins to London 1921 is part of the treaty negotiations to end the Anglo-Irish War as an economic advisor. 
once those terms were agreed to and they went back to Ireland, Collins asked Smitty to go to Washington, D.C., where his remit would be to try and gain U.S. recognition for the new Irish Free State and to also counter some of the efforts going on in the U.S. of the anti-treaty faction, folks opposed to that treaty that were going on amongst the Irish American community. It turns out apparently that most of the Irish American community, once they heard of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, were pretty overwhelmingly in approval of that. And there wasn't a strong faction against the treaty uh, in the US. Most Irish Americans were just happy that Ireland was at peace, hopefully it was before the Civil War, and that the terms of the treaty were good enough for Irish Americans to be happy with. Now, Smitty was not a diplomat. Uh, as he said, he was a, a, an academic. He was more of a technocrat. He had great expertise in economics and, and finances. Um, but he did gain the respect of the parties he had to deal with as he made the lobbying effort in Washington, D.C., amongst the various powers to get U.S. recognition. Next slide. So his task, Smitty's task in D.C. was not very straightforward. It wasn't like he could just knock on the door of the secretary of state or try and get an appointment with the president and make his pitch. There were a number of other parties that were parts of the discussion and decision-making process. Um, we had the U.S. State Department for sure, but even amongst the, the British, they had their foreign um, office and their colonial office, totally different parts of the administration there. You had the British Embassy in D.C. that had to be dealt with. And there were other, the, other British dominions like Canada and Australia that needed to be at least included in the discussions as to what might happen. And the free state representatives in London were also called in to make their own efforts amongst the, the British government in London. So all these things had to be um, played out. Lots of people had to be contacted and lots of arguments had to be made to make the case that Ireland deserved um, uh, recognition. Success finally did come when the British Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, shown here on the right, gave permission to his foreign and colonial offices that he had no objection to the U.S. doing, them, doing this. Um, interesting thing about uh, Ramsay MacDonald was he was one of the, he had one of the shortest tenures of any British Prime Minister, only um, nine months. He was also the very first British Prime Minister of the Labour Party. Um, but anyway, he sent his approval to uh, President Coolidge in the spring of 1924, and that's when things um, uh, started to move pretty quickly towards ultimate recognition. Next. So this is a photo of Timothy Smitty on the left being welcomed at the White House by an undersecretary of state, whose name I don't have. But you can see by their dress, it was a pretty formal affair. They've got their top hats in hand. They got their jackets and ties. So it was a ceremony that took place in the White House on October 7th, 1924. Apparently very sparsely attended. There are no photographs of the event. Um, during this, um, Smitty presented his diplomatic credentials. Coolidge accepted them. There's a, a short piece in the New York Times from this date that talks about the very, very short, brief comments that both Smitty and Coolidge made, um, thanking each other, respecting each other, that sort of thing. Um, the title given to Smitty at the time was Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary. It's a mouthful, and apparently it was not an uncommon diplomatic title at the time. It was recommended by the British ambassador. And essentially it means it's a step below an actual ambassador. And the British were pretty careful. They didn't want the Irish rep at this point in time to be called an ambassador. So it was an acceptable title to all parties involved. And um, that was the end of the ceremony. And I'll come back to this in a minute when I talk about the contrast with the reciprocal movement that happened in Dublin a few years later. Next. So backtracking a little bit to mention the Vermont uh, relationship to what we're talking about here. It was Vermont's own Calvin Coolidge, the only president born and raised in the state of Vermont, born in Plymouth Notch. Um, Calvin actually left Vermont when he graduated Amherst College. He settled in the Connecticut River Valley in Northampton, Mass., and he developed um, a pretty impressive political career. He first got elected to the Massachusetts legislature. 
He then got elected as mayor of um, Northampton. Uh, and then he became governor of Massachusetts. And then, and then in 1920, Warren Harding selected him as his running mate to run for as vice president. What happened, you know, Harding, as I mentioned earlier, died in office and Calvin Coolidge became president in 1923 and then on his own got elected president in 1924. It's interesting, and I don't know if this is just political speculation, but, you know, the recognition of the Irish Free State occurred in October of 24. That was a presidential election year that November. And there's some people who point out that perhaps Coolidge's motivation to do this may have been to gain some support from the Irish American community in his uh, election bid. We don't know that, but you know the Irish American community back then was pretty strongly supportive of the Democratic Party. Coolidge is a Republican. To the extent maybe this helped him with that community to get elected, we don't know. But anyway, people speculate about that. Next. So it, it took a while for the U.S. to reciprocate. You know, after Smitty was accepted um, as the envoy um, of the Irish Free State in Dublin, three years later in 1927, President Coolidge nominated Frederick Sterling to be the U.S. representative in Ireland. Um, it was pretty interesting when he finally arrived in Ireland in 1927. He arrived by boat um, from Wales, Hollyhead in Wales, to Dunleary, south of Dublin. When he got the harbor, there were 2,000 people waiting for him to cheer him on, virtually all the government dignitaries, a marching band. He was escorted by a, a contingent of the Irish Free State Army through the streets of Dublin to Phoenix Park to his, to his newly established home. So it's just an amazing contrast with the, the low-key affair three years earlier in Washington accepting Timothy Smitty, and then the reciprocal action three years later of Sterling being accepted in Dublin through incredible fanfare. Another interesting or, uh, anecdote about Sterling was he was a career diplomat. He had a number of foreign postings before Ireland. And uh, Coolidge probably made a, a good political move in making this appointment. A lot of people expected a prominent Irish American would get this posting. Um, Coolidge didn't do that. And the thinking there was whoever he opponent, uh, he um, nominated as a uh, Irish American would have had some opposition. You know, there were a lot of feelings, strong feelings on different sides within the Irish American community. And there would be a lot of bitterness over one Irish American being selected over another. Coolidge got rid of all that, that tension by nominating someone who is not Irish American. And by all um, records, it seems like he was well accepted by all sides at the time. He served in distinguished matter for a number of years in Dublin before going on to another foreign posting later in his career. Next. So after the, um, the Treaty of 22 and the establishment of the Free State and the conditions under which it was established, there were some changes that occurred over the next couple of decades. Uh, in 1931, for instance, there was the Treaty of Westminster, where the British Parliament finally agreed that, that they have no authority over the other dominions in the, the Commonwealth. So they gave up uh, control over Canada, Australia, not total control, but most over Canada, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand. In 1932, the Irish government, then under de Valera, who Liam has mentioned in his slides, um, they abolished the oath of allegiance to the king. And then in 37, there was a new constitution in the Irish Free State. They changed the name to, uh, to uh, oh, they considered it a republic, and they gave it the name ERA. Um, and they adopted the flag that Liam described in one of his slides. And then finally, in 1948, the Republic of Ireland became the official description of the country. Next. Now I'm leaping forward to contemporary times here, but there's a lot of talk now about what might happen in the future of partition. And some changes have occurred in Northern Ireland and uh, some of them just very, very recently. Michelle O'Neill is now the first minister of Northern Ireland. She's Sinn Féin rep for the first time that, uh, the, the Nationalist Party of Sinn Féin has gained a majority in Northern Ireland. Um, so we'll see what happens there. The picture, by the way, is uh, Michelle O'Neill on the left. And the woman on her right is Emma Little-Pengley. 
She's actually the Democratic Unionist Party de Deputy First Minister. They essentially share all responsibilities in the government govern, governance of Northern Ireland now. Then what might happen? And I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of rhetorical questions here. Um, there's talk now in Ireland. Well, now we're at the point where there may be a majority in the North that support getting rid of partition. What could happen? How might things unfold? Discussions are going on. There's no clear movement at the time. But anyway, it's, it's active in, in discussions in Ireland and, and outside of Ireland. So we're kind of at the end of this uh, presentation here and like to open it up for any comments you may have on anything we've said and develop some question and hopefully some answers uh, amongst the, you know, Liam and myself. So with that, I, I'm all done, Liam. And okay, we, I think we agreed that it would be useful to take a stretch here. Will everybody please uh, reactivate their video and unmute yourselves um, so that we can? Yeah, it's a, I have the function to ask to unmute. So everybody seems to be taking advantage of the little break there. Sure. We may have lost a couple of it fell off here. There's Ruth. Ruth, Kevin Mann, yeah, okay. So Ruth has got good points for asking the first question, <laughs> which is <laughs> is a, a very pertinent one, yeah. Now I'm gonna uh, I posed a couple of questions in the email that I sent you inviting you. So does anybody know why today is Pi Day? I'm seeing heads. Oh, yeah. Pie nope. Day. Yes, because it, it's 314. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> 314. Yeah. So. Always <laughs> makes me hungry. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah. yeah. So the other question I raised, and see if anybody's got any uh, any views on that. There's a uh, a holiday that's celebrated by over 60 countries, uh, but not on the same day. Uh, it's not a religious holiday or anything to do with the astronomical features. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you're mulling this over. Do you? Uh... Uh, I'm going to guess Labor Day. No, no, no. Mother's Day. It's no. It's it's celebrated on different days by different countries. Okay, Independence I Day. Say again. Independence Day. From whom? Whomever. No, no, no. You're or, on the right track. Okay. Or as a friend says, who are they? The hierarchy. The hierarchy. Oh, man. The hierarchy something you, like oppressing you, but I forget the E word. So there's over 60 countries that celebrate independence from Great Britain oh on different days yeah then the British Empire was a more remarkable uh, achievement uh, a great grudging admiration for the the people that that uh, put that together there um so Ruth you posed the question uh, how did how on earth did Sinn Féin gain a majority in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland? And I don't know that either Peter or I is competent to, uh, to amplify on that much. Has anybody got views? Well, let me just ask a clarifying question. I mean, a, a, you know, an addendum to that is I always assumed that the problem was population, right? That the the Protestants outnumbered the Catholics. And I'm just wondering, is that part of what has changed? 
Liam, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, what's yeah. happened, Ruth, is demography. <laughs> Population character characteristics have changed quite a bit in the last 20 or 30 years. And those who are Catholic nationalists have gained in population, while those who are loyalist unionists have, I don't think they've declined, but they're not growing at the same rate. So the population that is supportive of independence um, has grown. And now, just in the last year or two, has outpaced the, uh, or outgrown the, the loyalist unionist population. Was there any immigration involved, do you know? Not that I know of. Immigration into Northern Ireland by- Out, out of there. Protestants going back to Scotland or whatever. Not, not that I'm aware of. I don't think there's been a lot of demographic, you know, a lot of immigration, immigration in and out of Northern Ireland. So it was basically the the birth rate for the Catholics tipped the scale. Yeah, to be impolite about it, you could say they were outbred, and some would say <laughs> that. But... Whatever it takes. <laughs> But it doesn't mean that, you know, we'll eventually see reunification. And that, that can be a very complicated discussion and, and a long road to get to. But there are changes in the population that could suggest, you know, political changes in the near future. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, I, I was wondering if um, it's an indication of uh, more mixed uh, um, jurisdictions in the, the population. So kind of gerrymandering? Well, uh, I'm thinking it more uh, progressively where um, um, uh, folks are living um, from, you know, the two main sides um, in in a jurisdiction where, you know, uh, uh, it's not an enclave of one group or another, but a, a mixed riding, so to speak. And, um, the Sinn Féin comes out on top and maybe the uh, the second party gets, uh, you know, 40 percent or something. Instead of, you know, yeah. one side winning whole handedly because uh, of old gerrymandering. There's a, a number of issues like apparently Brexit came into it now because um the whole issue of borders being necessary between Northern Ireland and the uh, Republic with taxation and stuff like that. So uh, I can't claim any expertise at all on this phase. I'm, what I know best is 150 years old. So uh, my my thrust has always been studying uh, the, the mid 19 19th century um, movements. Um, you know, I, I think Northern Ireland still today is heavily segregated along religious and political lines. Unfortunately, even though we had the Good Friday Agreement from back in the late 90s, we don't have the terrorist activity anymore. Um, there hasn't been the societal integration amongst the two communities. We don't, we have very, very few mixed neighborhoods and communities. Belfast is very segregated into, this is Catholic nationalist and this is Protestant loyalist. That hasn't changed. And education is still segregated as well. So there are a lot of things that have to happen before the two communities really feel they can more closely get together and agree on things. I will say a an important um, event may be that the third largest party in Northern Ireland today is the Alliance Party. It's not associated with Catholics or Protestants. In fact, it, it's for, they, they want to be non-sectarian. They want to include people from all communities. And now they're the third largest party. And so th that's a new development. Um, so it's sort of indicative of perhaps society changing to accept, you know, the, the both communities and to get beyond the, the sectarian, you know, the hatreds that have been plaguing the society in the past, but but we'll see. Is there a um, question? Um, is there any question about Sinn Fein being the the current Sinn Fein being the uh, continuity of 
the old older historic Sinn Fein. I've I've come across um, not recently, but um, where it has been expressed that uh, it, it is not a uh, legitimate uh, um, claim uh, on on their part. Is there any? Is that a? You ever hear anything about that? I have not dabbled in current politics. Um, I figure it's safer to stay 100 years ago. Uh, I'm trying to, to do some things with Zoom here, and I may screw things up here, but uh, uh, I still see Kevin, but I don't see anybody else. Um, We're all still here. <laughs> so... I'm just getting one person at a time up here. Um, wow. Is there I a gallery? I have, Is there I a gallery? A gallery at, hmm. and I don't know why that wouldn't be still in the case. Yeah. I'm going to comment on, on, on Kevin's question. And I'm not sure if this is related, but I know the, the modern Sinn Féin uh, party in the Republic of Ireland. And now they're the yeah. biggest party in the Republic of Ireland. Reunification is part of their agenda, but I think a bigger part of their agenda and why they've become popular is to deal with the housing situation, unaffordability of issues, social welfare programs. So that's the top of their agenda. Um, to the extent maybe they're not the continuation of the more militant party of the past, I don't know, but they seem to be downplaying some of it. Okay, yeah. I, I, I have been fortunate enough to take the Sinn Féin walking tour of Dublin. Wow. And um, right. yeah, most memorable part of a trip I took to Ireland about 10 years ago. It, 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 the tour is uh, of uh, historically significant corners of Dublin that include alleyways and uh, back doors of some buildings where um, uh, events, uh, you know, in the uh, in the rebellion and the um, civil war um, took place, and uh, um, it's uh, yeah, one of the better, the best I've ever t ever taken. So <laughs> yeah, it, it leaves from uh, headquarters uh, at the end of uh, their office space. Uh, at a park at the end of O'Connell Street. Yeah. They seem to have done a good job of, of putting up plaques to to the around the area there. I don't know what when that dates from. Um I mean, they made a big deal out of uh, the centennial in nineteen sixteen. Um so I don't know if it, it, there was more effort to uh, get plaques up at that point, but so who gave you the tour, uh, the, the Fenian tour? Was that a private organization? It was the Sinn Féin party from party headquarters. Um, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't think of the uh, the park, um, but it's at the, at the uh, it's about four blocks uh, north of uh, the GPO. At the end of O'Connell Street or the beginning of O'Connell Street, It'd be St. Stephen's maybe. Or... Yeah, no, I, I would take that as the other the other end over near the University uh, Trinity College. So this would be the other end, not too far from the Gresham Hotel, uh, um, heading toward uh, in into North Dublin. You got a good idea where Guinness is located, but the rest of uh... And uh, did you get out to Glasnevin, the cemetery? Yeah, Wolf Tone, or Wolf Tone's buried? No. Is it in Wolf Tone? I don't know that. Wolf <laughs> Tone. Yeah, I I was at uh, on another trip to uh, the uh, commemoration on. Uh, 
uh, June event, maybe his death date at the cemetery. Hmm. Um, a lot of remarkable, um, you know, very noticeable, no noteworthy people, but some of them were hard to find. Uh, John O'Mahony, the founder of the Fenian Brotherhood, is buried there, but uh, nobody, including the staff and the uh, the uh, groundskeepers, could point me to it. I finally stumbled on it. Uh, um, quite an interesting place. I'm seeing a lot of uh, people supposedly still on board here, but they're muted, and I think they may have gone away. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. only seeing like four people oh. with videos. We do have another question and a and a comment in the chat. Do you want to take it? Um, the first one is from Ruth. She says, "Going back in history." Other oh, one. Can either of you speak to the rationale of Michael Collins' position, re free state versus independent Ireland? I don't know if you want to take that, Liam. I mean, I could speak to it, but I might be speculating wildly and probably shouldn't touch it. Well, I think it was the, uh, the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I read someplace that, and I believe it was Churchill, uh, was threatening to send several divisions of British troops over if the treaty was not accepted. Yeah. So I think it was just saying half a loaf is better than none. But does that track with what you know, Peter? Well, yeah, I had the feeling that the British finally got to the point where they said, take it or leave it. And if you, you don't take it, the Anglo-Irish War will resume. And, and escalate, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So good questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one from Sean McKenzie. And he's saying that people are sympathetic to the Palestine. And it seems to be truncated here. I don't know how you get the rest of the message. Yeah. Click on it. And sympathetic to Palestinian. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the people of Ireland are often sympathetic to famine. You know, they're they're big supporters of international. <laughs> I think once you've been there, you you tend to want to not go there again. Um, so okay, I got a, got a message here from Steve Crowley says he's around. Um, that pretty well winds up what I got to say. Other than uh, take a look at our. Uh, Fenian Historical Society um, uh, website, which is uh, uh, still in progress and not where I want it to be, but uh, uh, we're hoping to get a, a newsletter out um, and kind of uh, leverage this centennial of the Irish Free State um, this year with, with some uh, some further presentations that Peter and I have agreed we would do. Um, maybe with more emphasis on the uh, the connection with Vermont. Um, so I, I think I owe Ruth an explanation of what my the picture is on the back of my in my background. You got any, any thoughts about that? Ooh, is it, are you in Fairfield? No, that's, uh, that's a Fenian cannon left over from the 1870 attack on Eccles Hill in Quebec. Um, and uh, it was just refurbished and uh, they had a, a, a commemoration a couple of years ago during COVID when I didn't go. Uh, yeah. But they uh, they make a big deal out of it up there. They didn't get very far into Canada, uh, and apparently this uh, this one cannon was their their best shot at the at the British, uh, which were actually a bunch of militia farmers. Um, but when the whole thing broke down uh, and the cannon was abandoned, the story is that some 
enterprising Vermonters wheeled it across the uh, <laughs> the border to into Quebec and said, "Hey, you want to buy a cannon?" So uh, it's been there for over a hundred years now. Uh, they they did put up some very nice uh, interpretive plaques as part of this. You know? um, so, William, oh. Yes. Go, go, go ahead, Ruth. Go ahead. Um, so Steve Steve Crowley asked a question about uh, about well, I'll read it. How the intense local and even family splits from the Civil War have carried forward, and I've often wondered that as well. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks for bringing that to my attention. I see it now, but. Uh, um, I've learned to, to say well, which civil war are we talking? The, uh, the Irish or the American? <laughs> so I assume you're talking Irish civil war. I think so. Uh, and I don't have any insight. I've been to Ireland several times, I think 14. Uh, and I've talked to people about this yeah. era. Uh, but boy, they are pretty close mouthed. Uh, I know in my own family, I'm pretty sure my great grandfather was a Fenian because he quit being a Catholic because the Fenians were excommunicated. He said, You can be a Fenian or you can be a Catholic. Uh -huh. Huh. It was in 1867. Uh, um, so he was baptized a Catholic, but he, uh, but a lot of times I would seek out. Uh, family history from my grandfather. And the, usually the, the response was, what do you need to know that for? Yeah. So they just, yeah, let sleeping dogs lie, I guess. Uh, Steve, have you got uh, some experience yourself about? Um... Well, not, not direct experience, but I was there uh, in, uh about nine years ago in 2016 and and uh there was an exhibit i remember from that was in an art center a cultural center in galway that uh was art a lot of different artists um uh, and and it really focused on um uh, that question of what that this whole set of history how it lives today how it resonates and and you know from here we know that at least in certain parts of the country the civil war lives on in some people's minds and and that was a lot longer ago well yeah a lot longer ago than the irish um you know the civil war of the early 1900s that one and and uh you know that the movie that was uh, the uh in the the banshees of yep yep in i think that was the theme of that movie too was just how how does it you know how does that uh, history still resonate you know what I mean, you could go back to the Civil War. You could also go back to the cultural, you know, the even pre, uh, you know, pre-Catholic um, history of Ireland, and how does that all resonate today? And it just seems like a, 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 it seemed like they were making a big deal of it nine years ago, um, but uh, I, I wouldn't even know how, uh, you know, touchy it is, or if people feel like oh, it's ancient history, or if it's still. You know, it's, it's people who are alive today, their their parents or grandparents might have been a part of this. Yeah, it's uh, you got to tread carefully on that. It could be a real minefield. But I don't know if everybody's seen the uh, the, the delightful movie, the, the Banshees and the Share. Um, but at one point, the the policeman is going from the island back to the to the uh, mainland, and he said. Are the free state shooting a bunch of IRA people, or is it the other way around? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. but it's terrible. I mean, these were people knew each other. They were and they were executing each other. I had invited a a, a fella to join this, and um, he declined. He said, "I will not do anything to commemorate the the Irish free state." Uh, I went on quite a rant about um, so uh, the anti-treaty sentiment still lives on, but it would have been just 
I think, a terrible bloodbath if uh, Collins had not signed that treaty. I think between the Ulster volunteers and the, the people that they were threatening to send over from uh, from England, um, it would have been a total, total wipeout of a huge section of the population, I think. You know, Liam, if I could add, you know, I, I've been paying attention to Irish affairs for quite a while. And it does surprise me that the sentiments from the Irish Civil War are still out there. Time will, I think, kind of get rid of these over, you know, after a while. But it does surprise me that some really hard, bitter feelings are still there amongst people whose relatives were involved in that dispute. But again, I think eventually, you know, time will dissolve this. You know, another generation from now, that may go away. I mean, it's just bitter feelings at this point anyway. The uh, battle, of, battle of the Boyne was 1690, and it's yeah. still, being, still being an issue with the with the marches, yeah? Yeah. For the orange, uh, orange order celebrations of that. So uh, I don't know how many generations it takes, you know? Um, so that's it's nice to just visit with you folks. Uh, and yeah. I have you got any feedback on what we presented in terms of uh, tried to cram too much in there or too unfocused? Uh, um, uh, well, totally it? perfect, completely perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> right about no, it. No, no idea, Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, just I, the right I... amount of information that I can handle and con great context for it. And you guys did a great job of sharing. So thank you very much. Well, uh, well pleasure to do it. Peter's a good guy to work with. And uh, um, we seem to seem to have navigated this with a, with a great good humor. Uh, right. We don't hate each other at this point. So yeah, we're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, uh uh, I, could I add something uh, from a Canadian perspective? Um, uh, in my home in Bathurst, New Brunswick, I have a Burlington, Vermont connection with ah. a, a former. I knew, your, uh, I knew your name rang a bell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As as a student uh, some forty years ago there at St. Michael, I was a member of the Vermont Committee of for Irish Human Rights, and we um, uh, demonstrated and. Um, we uh, sponsored Bernadette Dublin speaking at the Irish oh, Arts Center one wow. evening and the terrific experience and so educational uh, for everybody in the community at the time. But um, um, I just want to highlight uh, mentioning the the um, the Fenian uh, threat to Canada. That's the way we look at it uh, in that um, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the Fenian presence uh, assembled um, on the main border with the province of New Brunswick, my province, and um, they never um, crossed the border. Um, uh, I forget uh, the exact reason why that military threat uh, um, didn't uh, take further action, but anyway, it is. Um, taught in our schools as one of the main reasons why um, uh, one of the main reasons why Canada confederated and um, uh, went from being British North America, a colony of England, uh, to uh, an independent or semi-independent country of Canada in 1867 because of a military threat that made them feel vulnerable and it got the pro-confederation um, um, uh, movement um, active active and uh, one of the reasons that led to uh, four of our ten provinces making um, uh, uh, an early Canada. The western part of Canada would come later but there was a tie in there in that uh, the US was looking at the Western Canadian lands as maybe being added to the uh, United States of America. 
and the Canadian nation um, in the 1870s and 80s quickly decided that that was a threat to uh, a future Canada nation and, and continued right through to the Pacific coast. But hmm. the impetus was the Fenians <laughs> assembling uh, at Eastport, Maine. <laughs> What was that, Elizabeth? What did you say? I said, wow, it actually worked after all, in a way. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that, that's great history to hear. Thanks, Kevin. Sean, where did you say you lived? In New Brunswick. Oh, Kevin. Yeah, Bathurst, New Brunswick. Where, which, what city? Uh, it's a small city, um, about uh, 15,000, maybe. Um, What's the name? I think. It, it is very close to the Quebec border. We're on the Atlantic coast. Nova Scotia is on our southern border. Mm -hmm. um, Prince Edward Island is just off our coast. Um, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Atlantic is, is there. We're a coastal province. What's, what's the name of your town that you live in? Bathurst. B-A-T-H. Yes, U-R-S-T. So... Yeah, they went over to Eastport. That was John O'Mahony's attempt at invading Canada, April okay. 1866. Okay, uh, yeah. What, what broke it up was that the uh, uh, everybody knew what they were about, but they shipped a lot of arms and people into Eastport, Maine. They actually did go up into the into Campobello Island, which was disputed, um, and um, actually was. Turned out to be Canadian area, but um, the ship they sent up there to break up the Fenians was named the Winooski. Interesting <laughs> enough, yeah. Uh, so familiar to all of us, I think, that are, are here. Probably. Onion River, Onion River, <laughs> Winooski. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've got uh, plans to go up there. I've never been to Eastport, and I want to. Uh, explore that. So I'll get a hold of you, Sean, and invite you down to to tour uh, tour that area with us. Yeah? Yeah. I I have to be careful going back into Canada. I lived in Ottawa for five years, but um, I was with the U.S. Embassy. Uh, but my Vermont license plate is Fenian, and I get some hard looks crossing into. <laughs> Canadian border sometimes. <laughs> so he carried any weapons. I said, not this time, but we may be back. Yeah. Well, when you're on the piers and the wharfs, uh, wharves at, at Eastport, imagine um, uh, uh, immigrant ships, famine ships, whatever, um, that would dock on the Canadian side and uh, supposedly let out uh, their cargo, their human cargo, Irish uh, paupers. Um, but at night, they would, on the New Brunswick side, um, cast the ropes off and drift over to Eastport. It was a tremendous Irish immigration entry point because the fare was cheaper to New Brunswick, Canada, that more people could afford than going into a U.S. port. Wow. So silently, secretly, clandestinely, the last part of their voyage was, was at night when they would simply drift across to Eastport and let out their cargo and they would head down, you know, Boston, New York, or uh, Pittsburgh, wherever they were going. And, um, um, it's it's not a uh, because it's not well documented obviously um, it's kind of um, um, something that can be further explored by uh, historians I think uh, if it can be if you pick is, is, is there a document or some historical writing of of this it's pretty fascinating yeah um, uh, I've been to, uh, over the years, because of my interest uh, in Irish uh, history, uh, been at several lectures by, uh, by historians, and, and, and that uh, I, I, I may have something uh, in a book, too, um, yeah, 
but that was a uh, that the uh, the currents are quite strong there in the Bay of Fundy. Mm -hmm. um, comes up through Campobello Island, Deer Island, and um, St. Andrews, New Brunswick, was mm -hmm. the was the access into and St. John, New Brunswick, very close by. Uh -huh. um, uh, and they have heavy Irish uh, concentrations today, mm -hmm. um, but 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 many um, just drifted. It was just a, a you know a half hour drift across to Eastport, and yeah. uh, wow. in the dark of night, uh, people hit the uh, immigrant trail down to uh, their destination, their real That's destination. It. Canada was just a cheap uh, the, Eastern Canada. Uh, had heavy, heavy immigration from the 20, 1820s on, um, right till the um, right till uh, the famine, um, and um, most uh, it was a stepping stone to the U.S. for for a significant portion of those people. It was just a cheap way to get to the U.S., but some stayed in Canada. Mm -hmm. Kevin, it sounds like. Kevin, it sounds like it will be a great presentation for um, next year's uh, Burlington Irish Heritage Festival. Thank Start working yeah, well, on it today. <laughs> we got to get that documentation that Mr. <laughs> Keating suggests. <laughs> no, it's a fascinating story, really amazing. Yeah, the secret, the secret trail to America, something like that. So, everybody. Uh... Is that you, Sean Sands and John Lonergan? Yeah. Sean, you, you said Burlington's John Lonergan was involved with the Fenians. Yeah. He was the head of the Vermont circles. He was the, the, the head Fenian in Vermont. Yeah. Um, and Liam, weren't you involved in some, maybe it was just pre like pandemic, but weren't you involved in some like establishing a celebration or some sort of thing with Lonergan? I've had several events, uh, put up a historical plaque at City Hall Park. Right, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, that's still there and uh, various other things, yeah. Um, wrote the book. So that's my one trick pony. I wrote a biography of, uh, of Lonergan. Do you have it at hand? You should hold it up for people that haven't seen it. Well, I can't push it through the, <laughs> through the screen. The uh, I, th I think most people have seen it. Having a discussion now. How do you get? Yeah, okay, that's there. Uh, there it is. Okay. Um, so if you join the uh, Fenian Historical Society, I'll send you an autographed copy of this. So. Uh, hmm. For fifty bucks, you get the hardcover. Anyway. Uh, we've got people that I'm not sure are still around. Margaret, are you still there, Margaret Harrington? I would say so, unless they've walked off. Yes, I'm still around. Okay, yeah, I'm still around. And and uh, your your presentation is much appreciated. I, I appreciated it very much, and I have a close connection to all of that because my father was in the uprising and the wars, and he was a diehard into uh, his emigration here to the United States in 29. So I really appreciate your presentation very much. And also uh, Mr. Keating. So thank you. Thank you all. Take thank care. You. Nice to see you, Margaret. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and we get, the nice thing about the Zoom is I don't think, uh, Sean would have come down for this, or or Ruth wouldn't have come from Colorado. So there's a um, there's that advantage. But uh, um, would you be interested if we expanded? Uh, yeah, you know, had another um, presentation on some aspect like you know. What's going to happen now with partition, with uh, with uh, Sinn Fein majority and and the Northern Ireland Assembly? Yeah, I'd I'd like to find somebody else that would present that. 
that knows what they're talking about. <laughs> I'd have to go out and, and do some digging because I, I, uh, I'm i just not steeped in it. So uh, if anybody knows of uh, a possible person that might present something like that, get a hold of Peter or myself. Um, so anything else that you can think of, Peter? That we ought no, to no I, I'm good. I think this went fairly well. I appreciate people hanging around and getting involved in discussions, And but I'm all set. Great. Great. Thank uh, you very much. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and I guess you'll let us know, maybe we could put the word out on the Irish Heritage Festival website or whatever, that if the recording is available at some point, because I would like to watch it with my father when I go home to visit for one. <laughs> well, you know, I did hit Zoom record and hopefully it's still going it's, on. It and... still says record. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we'll be able to do that, yeah. Well, I think we'll say, uh, Slauncha. It's been uh Bye, all. it's been a pleasure even remotely to uh yeah. associate with you folks and thank you for your interest and uh appreciate you sticking with us and, and uh uh the the whole zoom technology